in Christ and renewed every day. So uh, join me. It's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, through Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he ex he ex oh darn <laughs> he exerted, I think I need glasses, don't you? <laughs> he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them, at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the he heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And now bless the name of his word. Amen. Well, that was my fault with the sound because I was so anxious to get up here I flipped on my mic before I should have. So I'll take this one off and I think I'm on. Oh, yes. Louder than ever. <laughs> All right. We are uh, looking at this whole idea. Let me make sure that is off. Yeah, it's off. We're looking uh, this year, as you see in your little note sheet, and by the way, if you're here for the first time, just let me tell you, the note sheet, I, I seldom follow it, is basically for you to take home and study on your own or fill in the blanks, put a little more meat on the bone. But uh, this summer, our theme has been the wonder of it all. Based on 2 Corinthians 2.9, when Paul makes this amazing statement, he says, I has not seen ears not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And in that process, we started looking at the God of wonders, and then we looked at the, uh, the wonder of his love, the wonder of his word, and right now we're in a kind of an extended series within the series on the wonders of so great salvation. The writer of Hebrews gave us a stern warning in chapter 2, verse 3, when he said, after he had made some comments, he said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And as I mentioned before, and I know those of you who've been here every week, you don't like me to have to repeat this, but I want to catch everybody up to speed. We, uh, salvation is this amazing word that is like an umbrella, the word means so many different things. It means to be healed, or to be restored, to be delivered, to be set free, to be forgiven. And so under that, you find in the little introductory comments there, a description of what we've looked at so far. We've examined 15 different aspects of salvation. 
The best way to describe salvation, I think, is to look at it as a great, a beautiful diamond that has been specially hand-cut with all these different facets. And every time you look at one facet of it, you see another aspect of what really happened when Jesus Christ went to the cross and died our sin, died for us, so that we would be able to have the life that we could have no other way. And today we're looking at an aspect of that. After all these other 15 things, we're looking at the 16th one. We have a couple more to go. And the sixth way, this one we're looking at today is that salvation includes the assurance of victory. Now, most of us, uh, you know, I remember when I was on staff at a church back in uh, southwest Missouri years ago, we had a wonderful little lady there whose name was Glee Sterner. Uh, her first name was not really characteristic of her disposition. She was not especially known for her glee. And I remember when our pastor, Jim, uh, invited, welcomed her or, or talked to her after the service. You know, pastors a lot of times stand at the back of the, of the auditorium so they can uh, uh, check out and see who uh, didn't show up, basically is what it amounts to. But uh, uh, he, he said, Lee, uh, how are you today? And she said, well, I suppose I'm okay under the circumstances. And, and <clears throat> she lived under the circumstances instead of above the circumstances all the time. And yet God has given us the victory. And, and that word victory literally means to be delivered, to be set free, to be, to be rescued. And this is what he did for us when he sent his son to die for us. And, and a lot of times we forget that. And when we face, it's kind of like somebody said one day, you know, life wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't so daily. And, and uh, uh, you know, and, and then you have to run into people that you, that you see from time to time and you think, you know, the human race wouldn't be half bad if it wasn't for the people. And, uh, and so we, we go through this whole mix all the time of what, what our Christian life is really all about. And, and can I just tell you this? You know, I can summarize it and we could just dismiss uh, right now, I suppose. But I did spend a lot of hours preparing, so I, I think we should go ahead. But uh, the bottom line is this. I don't care how you feel about it. It doesn't make any difference what your mind is trying to tell you, what, how volatile and afraid, afraid your emotions might be. The fact of the matter is this. Jesus Christ has declared victory. He's declared victory over every area. And regardless of what our experiences may be, he has not changed. And the passage of scripture that Claudia read for us is one of my favorites, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But there's another passage that I want to just read to you real quickly. It's Psalm 98, because in this little psalm, we find the, the, the psalmist bringing together the idea of salvation and victory. And listen to what it says in Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him, and the Lord has made known his salvation. So here you have, in those two simple verses at the very beginning, the psalmist is bringing together this idea that whenever salvation is a reality in our lives, it is accompanied and it includes victory. Can I tell you that anything that you're dealing with any temptation you may have, any sin that you think you can't conquer, you're listening to the wrong voice because it is possible, and as we'll see as we get into this, it is possible for us to experience victory in our lives. That doesn't mean every, that we're always happy. That doesn't mean that we're without pain. It doesn't mean we're without suffering. But what it does mean is we can live in victory regardless of what it is, regardless of what the circumstance may be. And so that's what we want to look at this morning. And we're going to examine. Now, our struggles are center basically. We have external struggles that are caused by circumstances around us. But we also have internal struggles. But the victory doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between one and the other. It's the same. The victory that Christ has provided for us, doesn't, it includes all of life. The external circumstances around us, but also the internal things that we're going through. Now, 
This, uh, you see, uh, if you look in the, on the bottom, latter part of the uh, first page, you see the definition of victory, and I've already described it a little bit. But I want us to look more clearly at this passage of Scripture that Claudia read, and uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 1. And I want you to look at the process, because this is one of the most amazing things that uh, I remember when, when I first discovered this a long time ago. It just blew my mind. And... Uh, so this is what we see. In verse, uh, Paul, in verse uh, let's see, uh, verse, let's pick up in verse 18. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart can be enlightened or opened up so that you will see what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints uh, and, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now the word there is the word dunamis, from which you and I would get the word dynamite or dynamo. This is a, this is a word that, that Jesus used in, with his disciples in Acts 1-8 when he describes uh, to his, his disciples that you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But then in the next part of that verse, he actually uses three other words that are related to the power, and that is according to the working these are in accordance with the working, the word is energema, which basically means the ability to do what God has called us to do, and the working of the strength, that's the word kratos, or kratos, which basically means the ability to be what God has called us to be, and the strength of his might, which is, uh, is the word that basically means the, 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 the power and authority that God gives us. So, in this, we have this whole idea that, that, that Jesus, or that Paul is trying to help us understand that in, in Jesus Christ, when God raised him from the dead, he endued his son and gave through his son to us the ability, the supernatural dynamo, to be able to be everything that God has called us to be, and to have a sense of purpose and direction in whatever way God wants to use us, and to do or to, to, to do everything that God wants us to do, be, have, and do. This goes back to the series we did two years ago uh, on the, the critical questions and whether or not man is religious by nature. The fact we know he is, and the reason is because he was created to live exclusively for God and in, in an intimate relationship with God. But then Paul goes on, and he starts describing this in more detail. And he says, I want that the, he wrote it about in crisis in verse 20 when he raised him from the dead. But he didn't just raise him from the dead, but it goes on and says, and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now I want you to look at this. Far above what? All, little word, big meaning. All rule, all authority, all power, and all dominion. Now many of those words relate not just to earthly circumstances, but they relate to the spiritual realm, the spiritual world where, where spiritual beings are in various levels and, and, and situations of authority and control trying to steal away from you what Jesus Christ has provided for you. Obviously, <clears throat> he can't steal them away from you because they're yours, but he can uh, in intimidate you into thinking that you, you can't handle it because you don't have the strength and the energy and the power. And so he goes on and talks about that. And look at verse 22. That amazing statement. He has put all things under his feet. So what is he talking about here? All things. When Jesus Christ was seated, was raised again and seated at the right hand of the Father, everything in heaven and earth were placed under the feet of Jesus. We understand that. But, what does that have to do with you and me? Well, you go to the next chapter in verse 6, and here's what it says. He has raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the ages to come, he can show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to picture this. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. 
and we celebrate Easter. But sometimes we forget to celebrate what happened after that. Because when Christ was raised from the dead, he was immediately placed in authority and power at the right hand of the Father. The Bible tells us that he's our mediator. He's the one that stands in our behalf between us and God. How can otherwise a sinful, wretched man ever have access to a holy, righteous God? It's only through the person of Jesus Christ. And this Jesus Christ who shed his blood came back to life again, and he sits in authority and power. Remember in Acts 1.8 he says, I'll, uh, 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 you will receive power after the Holy Spirit is given, it, it comes upon you. But in Matthew 28.18 he says, all authority has been given to me. Authority is the right to do something. Power is the ability to do something. You see, if you were a police officer, for example, well, let's say that you were someone, and I may have used this a year or two ago. Let's say that uh, uh, use your wildest imagination and, and discover that we, we had a major traffic jam up, jam up here at the corner of Butler and uh, Main Street. We come close on uh, career days, don't we? And so you decided to take upon yourself to direct the traffic. So you get out of your car, and you go up and stand in that intersection, and you start blowing, you know, and yelling and moving your hands around, pointing to this guy and so forth and so on, and about three or four guys with semi-trucks come down the street, and they look at you and they think you're nuts, and they just about run you over. <laughs> However, if you go through police training and put on the uniform, you can stand in that same intersection, and because you have the authority to do it, you also have the power to stop those semis in their tracks. What's the difference? Authority. And so when Je God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in power and authority over all things and put everything under his feet, and then he raised you and me up. When we were born again, he brought us back to life. He gave us new life. And he gave us and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't want to get melodramatic or become, sound like I'm fanatical. But if I understand this scripture correctly, if I'm seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father, positionally, then everything and anything that's under the feet of Jesus is also under mine. Which tells me what? That when I have temptation coming my way, I have the power and the authority to resist it. And to resist it successfully. When I am tempted to sin, Paul in the 6th chapter of Romans tells us, sin does not need to master you. I don't know if you get this or not, but whenever you're tempted to sin, we do sin. We all sin. We probably all sin every day of the week. But the point is this. When we are tempted to sin, we have an alternative. We don't have to do it. When you're tempted to get angry at somebody, you have a choice. You don't have to get angry. And it's because of what God did in Jesus Christ when he seated him in his right hand and then brought us up and seated us there, the same power and authority that we can experience in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. But yet, how, mo how much of the time do you and I live in defeat? Or we give in to the temptation. Or we have something like somebody told me, I won't go into all the details because it's a very horrible, horrible experience, but when I was pastoring in St. Louis, my secretary came in one day and said, uh, if, you, if you know that what you're about to do is wrong and, and you shouldn't do it, but you're going to do it anyway, God will forgive you, won't he? <laughs> well, the first thing that went through my mind is you don't have a clue what forgiveness is all about. You see, it's, and Paul talks about this. He says it like this. He says, you know, if, if, if God's grace is so great, again, he's talking to the Romans. He says, if this grace is so great, then uh, should, and, and, and the greater the sin abounds, the greater God's grace, does that mean we ought to go, out, go ahead and just sin our, sin our ears off so that God's grace will abound more and more and more? And he says, absolutely not. That's a stupid idea. That's my translation, but... <laughs> But you see, we have to understand something. When you and I were born again, when, when we committed our lives to Christ, we entered into a whole new realm, a whole new world. And in that world of personal relationship, that world of salvation, we are responsible to live out our lives in a way that is holy and right.
righteous and represents the person to who, who saved us. And we don't have a right just to live our lives the way we want. When Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he said, don't you get it that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And he says, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. <clears throat> and so we need to get a hold of that. Now, you'll notice in the note sheet that there are five things that Jesus Christ gave us victory over. And the verses of Scripture are there, and, and, and you who are here all the time, you know that I, am, I, I really believe like the Bereans. You know, that it says about the Bereans and the Thessalon, Thessalonians, he says, the Bereans are more noble than those of Thessalonica because they what? They search the Scriptures daily to see if those things be true. Acts 17. And so this is what I like to do. This is why I put so many scripture. I want you to be able to go home, get your Bible out, and find out whether what I've told you today is true or not. And if it's not true, you need to let me know so I can repent. But if it is true, you need to repent. No, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. But you understand what I'm saying? And so if you look at this, the first thing that went, because when Jesus died on the cross, and rose again. He delivered us from six things. And the scripture's clear. And all I've done is I've just gone through the scriptures to find those verses of scripture that show us what he's did. The first thing he did is he delivered us from sin. He not only forgave me of my sin, but he delivered me so that I don't have to give in to it. And there is the power of the Holy Spirit within me to, to resist sin and temptation. And when I do sin, like Paul, John said in in 1 John 2, 1, he said, My little children, I write these things to you so that you don't sin. But when you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, don't let that be a cop-out so that, oh, yeah, well, Jesus is there. He'll take care of it, so I'll go ahead and sin. Don't make that mistake. We're committed to live as holy and godly a life as we possibly can. But he not only delivered us from sin, but he delivered us from self, from the flesh. Have you ever noticed that if you, if, if you want to know what it means to, on, the, on the flesh, uh, reverse the spelling of flesh and remove the H. And what do you have? Self. Galatians, Paul, Paul told the Galatian Christians, he said, the flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so that you can't do the things you ought to do. Galatians 5. In Romans chapter 7, Paul described his own journey after more than 20 years as a, as a disciple of Christ and as an apostle representing uh, the, Jesus Christ all around the, the, the Middle East. Paul, in verse 15 of chapter 7, says, I don't understand myself at all. He says, the things that I ought to do, I don't do it. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing it all, uh, anyway. And then he concludes the end of that chapter by saying, oh, wretched man that I am. Who'll deliver me from the body of this death? And then he answers his own question. I thank God. It has already been done through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has set me free. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation <laughs> to those who are in Christ. So we have the ability. I remember years ago hearing Dr. Charles Culpepper. Dr. Culpepper was one of three or four missionaries that Joanne and I had the privilege of knowing personally who were a part of the great Shandong revival in the Shandong province of China back in the 1930s. And I remember Dr. Culpepper telling about an experience he had. He was a contemporary to Watchman Nee, by the way, if any of you have ever read any of Watchman Nee's writings. But Dr. Culpepper tells the story of this young Chinese pastor they got a hold of this idea of Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And so the young pastor was telling Dr. Culpepper, he says, I tried like everything to crucify myself. He said, I know I'm supposed to live crucified. So he said, I, I laid down on the, on, on the floor and I put this hand up here and I picked the hammer up and I drove a nail in this hand. Then I laid the hand, hammer down and I put this one up here over and I reached down and picked up the hammer and all of a sudden I realized this hand got loose so he went on you can't crucify yourself you can't you see that's, trying, that's just trying to do better 
God doesn't want you to try harder. He wants you to quit trying. He wants you to simply accept what his son has already done. And that is he crucified. Paul talks about this in this passage of Scripture. He says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. And he goes on and he talks about this, how we have already been crucified. In one, in one scripture he says, I die daily. I have to be willing to lay aside all of my personal ambitions, all of my desires, all of my goals, all of my selfish thoughts, and be like, like to me to live is Christ and Christ alone. I love that song, in Christ alone. It's a powerful, powerful song. But we're also delivered and have victory over the demands of the law. I don't know if you thought about this or not. In the Levitical law, there were certain things that man had to do in order to be in right relationship with God. And every year, an animal sacrifice had to be offered for the sins of the people. When Jesus Christ came, as the writer of Hebrews describes, and offered a better covenant, a new covenant, we entered into a totally different covenant relationship with God. And in that, Jesus Christ, in the death of Jesus Christ, all the requirements of the law that were necessary to make us right with God and to have our sins taken care of. And so as a result of that, when you and I commit our lives to Christ, we enter into this amazing relationship where we don't want to have to go back again later or go to Jerusalem again or some other place and make atonements for our own sin. We don't have to come along and try to offer up good works like Cain did of the works of his own hands. We don't even have to come along like Abel did and offer up an animal sacrifice because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. There's nothing left for you to do except receive what he's offered, you see. And then he also gives us victory over the temptations and the influence of the world. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, Paul, or John says this. He says, don't love the world or the things that are in the world. And then he describes them. The lust of the flesh, that's the craving desire to do something apart from God. Paul said in Galatians 5, the flesh wars after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And then he says, not only the lust of the flesh, but the lust of the eye. That's the passionate desire to have something. Or the pride of life. That's the passionate to be something. So we come back to those same three words that we started with two years ago. To be somebody, have, so have something, and do something apart from God. It doesn't work, friends. And Jesus Christ has set us free and given us victory so that we don't have to give in to the temptations of the world to be somebody or to do something or have something. You'll never get a sense of accomplishment and purpose and satisfaction by what you accumulate or what you do or how famous you become. You get your sense of identity and your satisfaction only through the person of Jesus Christ. So we're set free. You see, we don't even have to, you don't have to give in. You know what's going on politically? Has anybody missed that? You don't have to be a part of that. I don't mean to stay away from it. I mean, you don't have to be impacted by it. You don't have to be affected by it. You can stand your ground. The Bible tells us that it is righteousness that exalts a nation, not politics. And sin is a reproach to all the people. And I can, I, I, you already know this, but I'll tell you again. It doesn't make any difference what the outcome of the elections are this year or two years from now. It's only Jesus Christ that can change our country. And the only way he'll change our country is when his people, people who, who follow him and trust him and name him as, him as their redeemer, begin to live lives that will impact the lives of other people to the point that changes can be made. And then the last, the next thing we see is that also he's destroyed the power, the, the power of Satan. Two of my favorite verses of scripture, 1 John 3, 6. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of 
the devil. And then in Colossians 2.15, I love this. This is a, Paul had this incredible way of painting an, an amazing picture with few words. When he says this, he says, He, Jesus, made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. What he's just doing, describing is he's, taught, he's describing the picture of a Roman victory parade. You see, back in Paul's day, if the Roman army came in and they conquered another king and his army, the first thing that happened was that the, the conquering general would come marching in with his lieutenants. And right behind him would, become, would come walking, never riding, walking. The, the, the conquering arm of general is on a horse. The defeated general is on his feet. He's in chains and he's being drugged, not drugged, but being led down the, 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 the great boulevards of Roman cities with the king, the defeated king, in chains walking down the road with his defeated army behind him and the conquering army then comes and follows up the, in the rear. And it is a parade. And this is what Paul is talking about when he says this, he has made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him. And so all the powers of darkness, however they may come at you, they're doing what they're doing illegally. And you have the victorious authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to resist. This is what James said in James 4, 7, I think it is. He said, submit yourselves to the Lord and resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. But you can't do it by just telling him, get out of here. You have to turn and look to the conquering general and say, get out of here. He defeated you. Everything that you're doing is illegal because you are the defeated foe. Now Paul makes it clear to us throughout Scripture, Ephesians 6, 2 Corinthians 10, and other places, that our battle is a spiritual battle. We may think it's a battle with a habit or that it's a battle with physical illness, and that may be true, but there oftentimes is a spiritual dynamic behind it that we need to deal with. I remember, and I, I, I've got to quit here real fast, but I remember in Seattle, Washington, many years ago, 30 years ago, I guess, when Joanne and I were doing a series of meetings, series of meetings up there, a lady came to me, and uh, who uh, she was the, the mother of uh, one of our associates, and she said, uh, I, uh, I've just been suffering from diabetes. And... Uh, I don't know why I asked her this, but I said, is this something that goes on in your family? And she said, yes, many members of my family in the past have had diabetes. And so we just prayed. And we just asked the Lord to break that cycle. That's 35 years ago. I still stay in touch with her on Facebook. I got a little note from her just a couple days ago. And she's been diabetes free ever since. Now, you can say what you want to about that. But I'm just telling you what happened. And what she discovered was that there was something going on, and I don't know what all it was, but there was something going on in her family life, in her family's line, where diabetes had become a major issue, and she concluded that this was not just a physical medical issue, but in this case, it was a spiritual issue as well. Now, I'm not telling you that everybody that has diabetes has a spiritual issue behind it, but I'm telling you this is that oftentimes behind all the stuff that you and I go through in relationships and, and, and finances and so forth and so on, they have this dynamic in which you need to deal with the powers of darkness. You, see? you need to take the authority that is found in Jesus Christ and address that issue through the promise that Christ has given to have victory, whatever it may be. Now, the last thing, of course, that you see there is he has set us free and given us victory over death. That's why we may experience sadness and grief, but we never experience defeat. That's why Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 
he's talking about he's talking about the resurrection. And he, so he finishes his little exhortation by saying, so, grave, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? I told this story last year, and I'll just mention it again. A little boy and his daddy were driving down the, riding down the street one day with the windows open, and a big bumblebee flew into the car. Well, the daddy knew that the little boy was allergic to bee stings. The boy was terrified, screaming and yelling and saying, help me, daddy, don't let him sting me, daddy. And so the daddy, the bee got up in the windshield and the daddy reached up and grabbed that bumblebee in his hand with his hand and stung him. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he removed the stinger out of death. Now, you and I will die unless Christ returns. It is appointed that the man wants to die and after that the judgment. So all of us face the inevitable. Some at older ages than others. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, we may grieve and we may be sad, but we're not defeated because Jesus rose from the dead and he defeated. So he says, grave, where is your victory? Death, where's your sting? Well, at the bottom of the sheet, there are some things that we can do in order for victory to be maintained in our lives. We need to understand that we are, according to Ephesians 2.10, we are God's poema. We are his incompleted symphonic poem. He's still in the process of shaping us and molding us into the likeness of his son. That's a lifelong process. We're never complete. Somebody asked a great a Roman sculptor, a great Italian sculptor one day, who was known for his beautiful horses made out of marble. And they asked him, how in the world can you take a, just a plain chunk of marble and turn it into every, a beautiful, beautiful horse like that? And he says, I knock off everything that doesn't look like a horse. When Jesus works in our lives, day by day, moment by moment, he's knocking off everything that doesn't look like him. Sometimes the hammers are big and the chisels are sharp. But the outcome is an incredible result. We also see that we, if we need wisdom, according to James, we ask the Lord to give us wisdom and how to deal with these issues. We're to bring our thoughts captive into obedience of Christ and start thinking the way God thinks about life instead of the way the world thinks or the way your family thinks or the way other people think or the way you think yourself. You see, whenever we compare ourselves to other people, we do one of two things. We either take our, compare our greatest strengths to their greatest weakness, or we compare our greatest weakness to their greatest strengths. And in both cases, we end up either with arrogance and pride, or such a disappointing, defeatist attitude that we can't do anything. But we need to see that in the beautiful work of salvation, when Christ redeemed us, he gave us victory. Now, if there is victory, the only way you can have victory if there's, if there's more than one person fighting. You have to have two people. Have you ever noticed you have to have two people to have an argument? Same way with spiritual battles. And so we know that the enemy is going to fight us in any way possible. But we also need to understand that Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 5, Paul says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And he says, this is the victory that overcomes the world. What is it? Our faith. Not how much faith that we have, but who our trust is in. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, the prophet said. But our hope is in God. So it's true. You're going to experience difficulties and hard times. That's a part of what it means to live in this world while we are affiliated with another world. But we need to recognize that Jesus Christ is the one that when he saved us, he gave us victory over everything. I want you to look at this song. We're going to sing it in a minute. Christ 
has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We're redeemed, and the price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. And then he says, I praise him for the cleansing blood that reconciled my soul to God. He cleansed my heart from all its sin, and now he reigns and rules therein. And then the last one, he gives me overcoming power and triumph in each trying hour. <laughs> what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. It's a great song. I don't know if you know it or not, but we're going to learn it if you don't. <laughs> Because it speaks to this whole idea that Jesus Christ is the mighty conqueror. One of the songs that my dad used to sing all the time was that song, The Mighty Conqueror. So let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts, knowing that not only have you forgiven us of our sin, not only have you cleansed us from even the stain, not only have you given us eternal life. Not only have you adopted us, not only have you made us just as if we had never sinned, but along with all the other things that you've done for us in this vast act of salvation, as you have given us the possibility of living in victory in the middle of a wretched, decrepit, torn, wicked world, so that we don't need to fear any intimidation that comes our way, but we can rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to destroy the works of the devil, and came to set captives free, and came to, 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 to crucify us to everything about the world. And so we thank you and we praise you for that. We bless you now in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Diane's going to come and lead us in this song, number 81. And so uh, stand up and let's sing it together.
stuff. So all of these sermons are posted on, on Greer AZ Chapel on Facebook. So you can actually link over to it, and the handout materials are there as well. So anyway, feel free to do that. So uh, now receive the benediction from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. Pastor made reference to that. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now go from this place and be a light unto the world, and all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. Amen.